8.33. Okay. I figured. So, good. My clock's not off. Although, it does seem to be for other people. Uh, you got friends of the class, you let them know uh, this kind of stuff matters on people all the time. So, you know, it is what it is. So, and again, not only does it correlate with grades, but uh, also we know that uh, hard to start habits. Uh, I mean, most of the times you're forming your habits, you've already started a lot of good habits already. Or got them in the system, but this is where you really set them. Uh, after 21, it's very difficult to rethink yourself. So keep doing what you're doing, and uh, hopefully, others watching this video will keep that in mind. Okay, a couple things to note. Now, y'all, uh, y'all were able to watch the videos, right? Boom and bust. Okay, so uh, I'll talk just a little bit about that. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the things I want you to notice are not who won the election down here, but uh, to look at the Electoral College, not just in general, but in particular, at Texas and California. Y'all, now I guess everybody knows how the Electoral College works, right? It was uh, 16 years ago we had the winner of the popular vote also lost the Electoral College, and you know, some of the founding fathers built in or so, kind of an interesting sort of thing. I thought it was interesting that I, uh, that I criticized the Electoral College a week or two before the election, and I got attacked by uh, people who thought that, uh, well, they were all over the place, but I, I guess they didn't even realize. They were attacking more based on family fathers, but I don't think they realized it was going to be that decisive in this election, uh, that it would go one way and not the other. I myself didn't see that coming. But what I want you to focus on are a number of electoral college votes. How did they determine how many, you know, the states and votes? How did they determine that? Uh, yeah, every every state gets two votes. It's basically the number of representatives and senators you have in Congress. That's how they determine electoral college votes. So if you didn't know that, now's a good time to jot that on down. And as you point out, the House of Representatives is determined by population. So every state gets at least two plus one representative. Every state gets one representative. No matter how small, which sounds like Dr. Seuss, a state's a state no matter how small. So the state I was in in 2000, uh, well, before the election, before I moved to D.C., was Delaware. They only have three counties, so they have, but they have two senators and one representative, because Delaware is a very small state, not very well populated. Montana, same thing. You know, not many people live in Montana, more glaciers than people. And so, uh, well, I, I don't know, I guess <laughs> maybe we'd have to like measure you know, how many glaciers we actually have. But they have three seats too. What, what it will show between 1900 and 1932, so it's a good thing for you to investigate uh, because keep in mind for the final exam, I'm going to look for a couple things, especially uh, a little test like this to say, <coughs> okay, was there a change? Now, rather than show the population to you, I'd like to teach a little something about the Electoral College. And also to note that there is a change in population. California and Texas, how much. If you're able to see that, you'll understand the importance of uh, Texas with oil and California with water. You know, the South was also very underpopulated, but significant growth occurred in the South. A lot of it due to something in Apalachicola, Florida. Anybody been to Apalachicola, Florida? Who's been there? Okay, you bet just one person? I got to go get down and get all, don't y'all like oysters? It's like one of the best oyster places you can find. There's a big oyster festival, and that's why we got down there. But I'm one of those annoying dads who every time there's like some historical marker, if I'm not stopping, I'm at least thinking about stopping. And one of those thinking about stopping times, I stopped over to a place in Apalachicola. It turned out there was a little house, and that's where the inventor of the refrigerator is. And why you should find this interesting. Because you think about it, I mean, what would you use to store food? Can you imagine the South during the summer trying to store something? <laughs> you you might get a you might get a high tolerance for uh, certain kinds of food. I, ironically, John, uh, some leftover slices of blue cheese that we had cut, special deli cut, and I think we had mold on it. I kept thinking it's hard to tell, you know. So I was like critically analyzing it, like. <laughs> 
<laughs> for blue cheese is predicated on mold, how can you know if there's like actual mold mold like you're not supposed to eat versus mold that is tolerable? But yeah, air conditioning, refrigeration definitely changed the sound. Believe it or not, the guy who invented the refrigerator didn't quite know what he had on his, on, on, uh, on his hands because he did not invent it. He did not invent it for the sake of refrigerating food. He invented it for the refrigeration of people. People. That sounds kind of gruesome, doesn't it? No, don't worry. This is not Dr. Lecter. This is not, uh, uh, who's that guy from Milwaukee? Jeffrey Dahmer, whose apartment was only a few blocks away from my door. No, it's nothing like that. He was uh, treating polio uh, victims or victims of high fevers and stuff, and he was trying to develop something that would help keep the patients cool during the day, thus refrigeration. Benefit of uh, your studies is to take a look at uh, thinking about where there's a need where one doesn't currently exist. And also, once an invention's been made, trying to find a new application for this. Like the space program. They built a couple things to uh, keep the uh, keep our rockets, keep our space shuttle from uh, catching fire, blowing up certain kinds of fiberglass material. Somebody else figured out that this could be used to uh, heat things up in this new invention we had, the microwave, which radically changed food consumption in America forever. If you don't believe me, if I got toaster oven, think about what can go in a toaster oven can't go into the toaster oven and how that's changed your food. But it was, you know, inventions that were made for the space shuttle suddenly could be turned around and change everyday people's lives in terms of what we eat, how we eat it, and how quickly we eat it. Yeah, my, my sister-in-law and uh, her husband had a toaster oven let down from their parents and it never gets used. But I was just thinking it's funny they still have a toaster oven. Very small, it, you know, you can't have, so they can't put a meal in there. Can't put very much in it. So I want you to take a look. So uh, analyze how many votes each state has between 1900 and 1932 when the episode boom occurred, as well as how the oil discoveries changed transportation in America. I also want you to take a look at America, the story of us bust. It's a little bit of homework on your own. Not only to find out about the Great Depression, why it occurred, the economic and environmental consequences, how we tried to get out of it. And not only that, but to take a look at the evidence to see, was it really our worst ever economic downturn in our history? Little side note, I don't think you uh, don't know if it's in the video or not. I, I, I last saw it in July, so I'm trying to remember back to July. But it seemed like July was an eternity. It was even before the convention, folks. But I remember uh, that I was, uh, at the same time, I was also listening to a book on CD about uh, FDR. And when they talked about Herbert Hoover, he felt that what they used to call these things were panics. Like the panic of whatever, the panic of 1873, the panic of 1837, the panic of, uh, it's like 1894. But they thought panic sounds really bad, so instead Herbert Hoover decided to coin this, a new thing. He said, let's just call it a depression, that'll sound so much better. And that's why they call it the Great Depression. They just decided to coin a new term so that people wouldn't panic. We just call it a depression. But of course, it was a long, lengthy thing, and it tended to be kind of depressed. The guy who carved the uh, Mount Rushmore, anybody been to Mount Rushmore? It's on my bucket list. My brother-in-law and, uh, and his kids have seen it, but I haven't seen it yet. The guy who carved Mount Rushmore, which was during, was, which was during this time, he once said of Herbert Hoover, who was you know, a very brilliant person, had a great mind. Hoover Institute at Stanford is named for him, incredible library one of the longest living presidents we've had and helped rebuild Europe after two world wars. So he's got a lot of accomplishments. In terms of politics, uh, that was not his thing. 
the guy who carved Mount Rushmore said to Herbert Hoover, if you put a rose in his hand, it would wilt. <laughs> the opposite of the Midas touch. He had a lot of ways of things blowing up in his face. So I want you to check the data. Do a little research for yourself and see for yourself in terms of the length of a recession, which has been the longest. We finally come to a Horatio Alger story. Oh, good. Andy's here. You're going to talk a lot today. <laughs> You're looking, oh, we just slipped in. <laughs> no, it's, it, uh, Andy, Andy's one of the people who wrote about this subject, uh, Horatio Alger stories. Yeah, Horatio Alger stories really captured the American spirit of the 1800s, and the legacy lives on today. I bet you didn't know this, but they. They still have a Horatio Alger Award, which is given out by the Horatio Alger Society. It tends to have some fairly wealthy uh, folks involved in it. And it goes out to the best rags to riches story that's out there. I was so fortunate when I taught American Experience in 2004 uh, to get as my first speaker in Dixon Assembly Room. My first speaker was the winner of the Horatio Alger Award, or a previous winner. And this person went from being a burger flipper at Burger King to the CEO of Godfather's Pizza. At the time when I brought this person in, he was not a national sensation, but I bet you a majority of you have heard of his name. Anybody know who I'm speaking of? I said the name Herman Cain, but you know who I was talking about? Yeah. So before most people knew who he was, before he ran for president and was actually leading the presidential race, in 2012, before he dropped out. Uh, yeah, he was the CEO of Godfather's Pizza, but he got his origins starting from being a burger flipper. And he tried to socks out for everybody who was there. And he, uh, who knows, he might have a role in Donald Trump's administration. Have y'all seen him? Okay, we can like take a little look up, take a look at his bio. So, I, I mean, if, if I caught, I, I probably could have caught him after he became sort of like a big national sensation. He's like, he's like on Fox News, he's a contributor from time to time, I'll see. <coughs> uh, but nevertheless, yeah, this idea of the Horatio Alger story and these rags to riches of, uh, kind of lead us into the myth of individual opportunity, that America is a country where anyone can succeed. We'll hear strong arguments for that and strong arguments against it. Anytime I teach a class, by the way, I try to give you the strongest possible argument, and encourage both of you, all of you to do this too, the strongest possible argument for both sides. You can't understand an argument unless you understand both sides really, really well. So, whatever your choice is for what you want to believe is completely up to you. I expect you to know both sides pretty well. Sound good? Because oftentimes, where people get arguments poorly is they just don't understand the other side. That's when you get people talking past each other. And it tends to be pretty unproductive. We're not productive. Okay, tell me about Ragged Dick. Or what was his name? Richard. Richard something Esquire. Did he have a name? I'm trying to think. Richard something. I always keep saying Richard Sherman. But that's because I watched uh, Seahawks Patriots game last night, so it's not Richard Sherman. <laughs> Tell me about this Richard, it's not that long a piece. Tell me something about him. What's he do? What's his job? It's all quiet. Don't be quiet. Quiet people don't be. Come on, take a risk. Short reading. What was it like? Three pages? Can't be that hard. Go ahead. Sing it out. What's it about? Hey, we're even on schedule today, so you can't get me on that. Tell me, what is it? No, I, you don't need to look it up. Tell me. Tell me about it. It's November 14th, right? On the something list for today, right? That hard. No, no, no. What's he do, though? Oh, 
shiner. Thank you, Andy. He's a shoe shiner. I know you know because I read your paper. <laughs> Are you going to have to carry everybody today? Oh, you shouldn't let one person carry a class. Not good, folks. Yeah, he's a shoe shiner. High income, middle income, low income. <coughs> okay, it's kind of lower income. Yeah. I said it because, like, when I was in Tanzania, shameless plug. Yes, I give a CE event tonight about Tanzania, and I serve coffee, and they're also going to have like little desserts. Who gives you those with the CE event? Everybody completed your CE events? Everybody all finished? Stop nodding, Bruno. Hey, you finished them all. Anybody else finished all your CE? Then come on over tonight. Uh, Jacob, you did? Yeah, you're an English major. They do that. Don't whip me if I don't have all my CE. Right, so the, the, uh, the CE at 6.30 tomorrow. It's uh, in the Sierra Club. And Ooh. Free sushi. Oh, wow. Free sushi. Oh, I like sushi. I have to, I have to find a way to go to that. That sounds interesting. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, like over in Tanzania, like people who are baristas, like, you know, the folks who work at Starbucks, those people are like considered, I mean, you know, highly skilled. I mean, you're going to, you know, coffee's a big deal over there. You're going to be middle middle to upper class if you're a barista over in, over in Tanzania or Kenya. That's an art. People, I mean, you got to do the coffee right. So, he's... Lower income, yeah, I guess that happens for somebody who shines their shoes. It used to be, you know, most of us knew how to shine them, but, you know, if you're traveling, a lot of times going to work, you get your shoes scuffed up, you need somebody to touch it on. Uh, okay, tell me more about it then. You were saying something, Brittany. Oh, are you looking up your notes? You're not looking at Wikipedia, are you? Okay, good. <laughs> you're not looking at WikiLeaks, are you? <laughs> Come on, folks. <laughs> I know, everybody's traumatized by the way. I was like, somebody came to me, by the way, after class, and they're like, Dr. Harris, Dr. Harris, nobody's supposed to speak, uh, we got a memo, nobody's supposed to speak about politics on campus. I was like, well, going to make my job hard. <laughs> Being the political scientist. <laughs> I think what they were trying to say is just be, just be civil in our discussions. That's what I think the <laughs> So what's he trying to do? He's... Okay, so in other words, what's he thinking? Bigger picture. He's lower income. He's thinking he's he's what they uh, what they call in sociology or communications or any other ology as upwardly mobile. He's he's thinking already. Not I'm going to stay lower class all my life, but I'm going to go up to the east side. I'm going to try and move up out of my station. Not going to try and stay there. It's not like, well, my parents were shoe shiners, and I'm a shoe shiner. My kids are going to be shoe shiners, and uh, you know, ten generations from now, we're going to have like a, a family of shoe shiners. Why did I bring that up? Why did I bring that up? Go ahead, Jacob. Take a guess. What the hell is Dr. Torres thinking? Some people are just like that. They feel the need to stay where they're at because that's what they're like raised on. Who thinks that way? Does the lower class? No, we're talking, okay, don't just think like America, United States, 2016, 8.53 in the morning. No, think bigger picture. Think back through history. Think about where people come from. Come and go. Think about your humanities classes. You had to take humanities classes. Get in here, right? Like places that have like caste systems and stuff like that where you stay the same. Okay, oh, so we have caste systems, right, where people are locked into a position. Anything else besides a caste system? What? Education. Oh, okay. We're not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. That's like sort of like a modern critique of where we are. Okay, but not bad. I like that. Risk taking. Good job, Elizabeth. But what's? Yeah, you're right. We did talk about how some schools they kind of funnel us into certain areas or so. Not what schools were intended to be, but that's how they turn out. Why do you think they turn out that way? Maybe that gets us. Maybe you started us off on something, Elizabeth. Anything else in our history? where people are locked into certain positions. You're gonna stay that way, you're gonna be born in that. There's caste system, okay, that brings in a race and ethnic dimension. How about an economic dimension? 
Come on, folks. Now give me ideas. History and stuff. Where did Americans come from? What was it like in the old place?
Don't y'all watch Game of Thrones? Some of that's based on War of the Roses, the, the War of the Five Kings in France. You're not supposed to move up or down. You're caught with the wrong person, you'd be dead. You're going to try and move on up. You better be a good fighter. You better have a big army behind you. Nobody moves up or down the scale. Everybody stays where they're at. Don't you remember there's like some great scene where Heath Ledger, he's, he's a peasant. Actually, he's not a peasant. He's like a, what do you go, with the people who serve knights, what do you call those folks? Like squires, yeah. Dr. J's first team in NBA was the Virginia Squires. I always thought that was a neat name. Yeah, you're, he's like an assistant to a knight. The knight dies, and he tries to take that person's identity. Identity theft, 1500 style. But in making that, he's trying to make that decision. He actually asked, utters the phrase, can a man change his stars? In other words, am I, you know, your stars are your destiny. People were much bigger into astrology. Now we kind of make fun of astrology or so, right? If you go over to consult an astrologist before your next exam, you're probably kind of going into the back entrance going, <laughs> don't tell anybody. But back then, they really believed it. Jordan, do you remember that scene in uh, Knight's Tale where uh, Heath Ledger decides to assume the identity of uh, Sir William, whatever, it's like a knight? Which, if you're a knight, that means you're going well. That means you're the next step up. And he asks the question, he says something about, can man change his stars? Remember that? He's yeah. asking that question. Can you change your fate? Do I always have to be a peasant? Do I always have to be a squire? Do I always have to be lower class? Or can I move from one to the other? Is it possible? Sure, you can put on a, you can put on a helmet. You can put on fancy gear. You can call yourself Sir William. Have I seen the movie? I mean, is that all you need to do? What do you need to do to do well? To stay at night? Results, right? If you're going to stay in that, that's that's one of the premise of the movie. It's not just you know claiming that you're somebody. If he wants to get to the next step, because isn't he interested in some gal from royalty? Yeah. He's got to work his way up, right? And they see him in the tournaments. He's got to battle other people. It's kind of like the Jacksonville Jaguars. If they want to move up to the next level, they have to prove it on the field. They have to beat a bunch of other teams, you know, move their way up. You're shaking your head like this ain't going to happen. <laughs> Can the Jaguars change their stars? <laughs> right? Now contrast that with America, the United States, or at least the idea we have of America. What's this story like? Contrast this with feudalism and peasant nobility royalty era. That's what America is seen. Not just by Americans but worldwide. Doesn't this get at the term the American dream? People think the American dream is like results oriented, but what it is is it's actually opportunity oriented. That if you work hard, whoever wants it more can succeed. Anybody ever watch March Madness? Raise your hand if you watch March Madness. Heck, I think even people don't give a rip about sports watch March Madness. We all have like our little betting pools, right? Or you're in a contest. You ever see those? And everyone on first day, everybody loves the first day. I'll bet you the ratings for the first day are more exciting or are much bigger. We can test this. I'll bet you the ratings for the first day are bigger than the ratings for the final game. Why? Brackets. What? Brackets. Brackets. Brackets, yes, but why? What appeals to everybody? What appeals? There's what like, makes March Madness an American institution? There's like that number 14 seed playing the number one seed. They always, there's always one upset. Of yes. There's always, there's always a couple, not all of them. Overall, you know, the, 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 team, the teams that are better ranked on average will win more. But yes, you'll always have upsets. Schools we never even heard of do incredible things. Then they have like almost all of us, uh, Jordan, you ever, did you have Michigan State in the bracket, like in the final four, they had so many teams, like in the final four, and the first round, some team, who was it anyway? 
I remember Michigan State was a trendy, uh, when I went to the NCAA, uh, some NCAA games that were in Tallahassee, uh, Michigan State was a trendy pick. Magic Johnson's coach from Michigan State was retiring. It was his last year. They were a high seed. Everyone plugged him into at least, if not the Final Four, then the Elite Eight. They were the trendy pick. And a, a, uh, a school that most people couldn't even locate its state, Weber State, came out of nowhere and shocked him in overtime. I don't even know which state Weber State is in today. <laughs> Can anybody tell me? <laughs> Weber State. I know Brittany a little bit. <laughs> Brittany's plugged in. Yeah, Weber State. They have a state named Weber, and they won. Right? We think of like like the Richmond Spiders upsetting the Syracuse Orange Men. That's over two. Mercer beating Duke. Mercer beating Duke. Oh my God. David Fowler, Judge Fowler, who teaches there. Mercer, law grad. LC undergrad, and I was going crazy. I was presenting over in Alabama. I kept my phone. It's like, beep, beep, beep. I was like, shut up. What's going on? <laughs> it was all about how Mercer was looking like they might be. Yeah, it's where anyone can be. Anybody. And whenever this happens, they always have a catchphrase, don't they? When the big upset occurs. Y'all ever upset somebody, a number one seed in your conference? You ever done that? Awesome, Billy, isn't it? And afterwards, they'll say, Grange College Panthers wanted it more. Right? Don't they always say that during March Madness? No matter what your ranking is, no matter what your previous record is, the winning team won because they wanted it more. It's not that like Duke didn't want to win. Right? It's not like Duke wasn't trying. But think about it. That is the greatest victory in Mercer's history of any sport. Duke, that's not even their most important game of the year. <laughs> it's probably some televised match for North Carolina, right? That kid from Mercer who sinks the winning shot, you know, that's that person's life. I mean, he'll be elected uh, state representative from that area. Duke person makes the shot, yeah, you go up on the wall of fame with 300 other players. Does that make sense? Is it, it's, it's kind of, March Madness is an American institution. It shows that in, it proves to us, it validates for us, that anyone with hard work, maybe a little luck, can succeed. Does it not? That's why Americans are big into sports. Have you heard this phrase? Sports is the ultimate reality show. You can't script it. Hell, it's more reality show than the reality shows, which are all like fixed, right? <laughs> it comes down to hard. It's not always about talent. That's where America busts things. It's not a talentocracy. It's a workocracy. It's a wanted it moreocracy. Man, we're people can succeed. Is Dick a hardworking person? Yeah. Yeah, he's. He's not like one of those who uh, shows up shows up to eight o'clock work at eight thirty, coffee break at nine to nine fifteen. Some days nine twenty, lunch at eleven thirty, back at one thirty. Nice warm Sunday day, so he'll take off at three. He's not one of those, is he? Now he's a hard worker. What's he do with his money? Saves it. That's got to be tough if you're a lower income. Some people believe, ah, lower income. It's all about instant gratification. Don't have much to look forward to. How exciting do you think Shining Shoes is? Is that the kind of thing that gets you up in the morning? No, I think it's his, I, I think it's like, he, you know, he's aiming at a different class. He's aiming middle class. Saving will help him get there. In more ways than we realize. It wouldn't be a Horatio Alger story without a little bit of luck in there. What's the little bit of luck, folks? Now you've had time to frankly read it on your laptops, <laughs> your cell phones, or hell, even the book. <laughs> What's the little luck? Help out Andy, because I'm going to call on Andy otherwise. He like, saves the child of this man who has money. Whoa, that is luck, folks, isn't it? <laughs> Will someone save my child? I'll save him. 
Anybody got me? Is that a Superman trick? Is that a Superman trick? Yeah. It is. <laughs> Except you got it backwards, man. You're supposed to open up and it's going to be a Superman trick. You got Superman on the outside. <laughs> Da, 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 you just rip, rip on the shirt and you got the big S. Don't forget, Superman is seen very much as an American icon, right? And jumping into the water. The Staten Island Ferry, nice little placid pool. If you read that book I told you about, the good old days, they were terrible. You'll get to realize that jumping into the toxic soup that is Staten Island, <laughs> complete with sharks feeding off like the, uh, <laughs> the food and everything, that is... It's not, it's not like jumping into the Navatorium, folks. Unless you're talking about super high dive. Anybody done the high dive again? Elizabeth, no high dive for you? Okay. My daughter had a little twin. They were born almost at the same time. They looked identical. She would run off the high dive like at full speed. Just fly off the end. <laughs> My daughter was too afraid to like jump in on the side of the. It's the only way you can tell they looked identical. The only way you can tell them apart is, I mean, little Bria would like run through a brick wall, and my daughter <laughs> was like the most cautious kid. This is more than just jumping in. This is more than just, wow, you're hitting the jackpot. You saved a rich person. Taking advantage of an opportunity. That's what it's really about. It's not Horatia Eldridge, it, Horatia Eldridge isn't just saying, hey, some folks will be lucky and some aren't. It's life in America will present you always with some opportunity, but you've got to be a risk taker to do it. that everybody has that opportunity. The question is whether you will seize it or not. Okay, rescues the kid. And uh, rich guy says, here, marry my daughter and you'll be taken as my son-in-law and I'll give you all the fame and fortune and riches. And no, nope, there ain't no magic lamp here on this one, folks. What does happen? No, uh, rich man buys him a new suit and tells him to come be at his office. Ooh, office, so he's going to be the new VP. That stands for vice president. Is that what happens? No, uh, he goes and meets him and um, he offers his job as a clerk, I want to say. And he's killing him. <laughs> he saved his son and he gets the... Actually, I had a student save his son. It's like, save his son and all he gets to be is a clerk? That's all you get? <laughs> Saving a servant, maybe, but saving a son. He offers him ten dollars a week, which is I mean, if you can't leave, that's everything that he has in the bank. So. Why do you think he did this? Why and why is this in the story? Shouldn't you want people to be excited about getting that upper class position? I mean, saved a rich man's son. Shouldn't that be worth more? Why is it important that he gets a clerk job? What is clerk? Upper class? No. Nope. Middle class. Middle class. Even maybe on the lower middle class side or on the upper middle class side? The, work the working class side. The working middle class side. Still better than what he had already. Yep. Yeah. Going from blue collar to white collar. In this case, it was yellow collar, but so I don't know that one. But yeah, blue collar working with your hands to white collar working with your mind. Although, certainly some blue, blue uh, collar jobs definitely involve a lot of your mind. But not the job he was doing. Shoe shine doesn't involve a lot of taxing your brain too much. But being a clerk and having to be good with numbers and good with people. So if you think about it, going back to myths, going back to variables, success in America, what are the ingredients for success? What do we got? What have we learned today? Okay, you got to think. You can't think about where you are now. You got to think about where you're going. Hard work. Hard work. Very key variables. Anything else? 
Take advantage of opportunity. Opportunity knocks, answer the door. Make sense? All of these factors come into play. Anybody seen the movie uh, Pursuit of Happiness? True story. Uh, I used uh, Pursuit of Happiness in class, like when I mentioned I did this. Uh, I saw. Some, I was doing research on Chris Gardner, the real life person, and I saw. Uh, I saw something on the website when I was getting some of his bio just to check out the story. And it says, email Chris. Okay, why not? So I emailed him how I'm using uh, his movie in the American Experience class. And I got an email back from somebody at the investment firm where he works going like, hey, Chris liked your email a lot. Would you like an autographed copy of the book? I was like, yeah, sure. It's, a, it's a, an autographed copy of the book. <laughs> I thought that was kind of nice. What's in that story? Tell me about that story. Kid, by the way, I, that's what that's how our kids are. <laughs> when they're like, 
I find myself over and over again going to my son and my daughter, I'm like, how did you get to be so smart? It didn't come from me. I wasn't thinking like that as a kid. Yeah, that's what's. Andy, isn't there a story over in uh, Taiwan, kind of along these lines? Your paper? Uh, you're pointing out that there's like a, perhaps a famous person in Taiwan. Somebody who started out lower class, lower middle class, yeah. work his way out on a rural family, and decided to kind of work, uh, study hard, and then become a lawyer and the mayor, and then finally the president. Yeah. So, so Chen Shubian, who's like a major figure, he was part of the opposition party. Usually the Kuomintang win, right? The, the dominant party, the KMT. They usually win, but he. Uh, Able to study hard, work hard in school, right? In school was his big ticket up. Joined the outside party, the Democratic Progressive Party, and was able to get all the way to the president from otherwise humble origins. Sounds like a cool story. Following a lot of these prescriptions. So, what do you think? of feudalism in this country? Maybe not the barriers of the upper, middle, and lower class. Why don't you just give somebody a lot of money? When somebody wins the lottery, do they get all the money? Why don't they do that? The what? Well, yeah, but no, I understand. But why don't they just, boom, here's, 10, here's 15 million. Like, why don't they do that? How do they give it? Yeah, they, 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 they parse out a little at a time. Why do they do that? Why didn't you just give somebody 15 million? I want 15 million. If you think about it, that rich guy's kind of giving him $10,000, but he's like parsing it on out. Why do you do that? Well, they have those shows where like, it says that like, winning the lottery ruined their life. Oh, why would it? <laughs> I should be so lucky as to have my life ruined by winning the lottery. Why does this happen, well, Megan? Like, all of a sudden, they have so much money that they don't know what to do with it, and then they <laughs> but it makes people stupid. <laughs> Reminds me of a joke I heard from my pastor. When I started, too bad Brandon's not here, he can use this one. The story about a uh, family, young man has, uh, has, a, has a rich aunt who dies and has left him $10 million. And the family, they call him the pastor and they say, I've got a problem. This young man, 18 years old, he's going to suddenly inherit $10 million got to find out the most creative way to break it to him. Can we get him in a way where he won't get stupid with money? The pastor goes, okay, I think I got this. So the pastor uh, meets with the uh, young man in his office and he says, okay, let's just say, you know, hypothetically, that you were to inherit $10 million. What would you do with it? The young man says, oh, I'd give it all to the church. The pastor fell over dead of a heart attack. 
Maybe the pastor just gets, <laughs> doesn't die by the end. <laughs> Has to spend a few days in the hospital. Would that make it better? But you get, you know, maybe that's what it is. Money, but it doesn't seem to affect rich people. <laughs> Don't they swap 10, 15 million around? It'll, you make 15 million in an hour, certain lucky transactions. I wonder why they think that money would ruin us somehow. Do you believe that there's some thought that middle class and lower class just can't handle all that money? Is it kind of a looking down the nose of leaders? Do you think? Or do you think that's true? We just can't. <laughs> money would make any of us stupid. featured on one of those uh, HGTV shows. My wife loves watching those. He and his wife were on the show, HGTV, where they would like, they, they follow a couple around. They're going to try and buy which of their three dream vacation homes. So you got to be one of the people who was like buying a vacation home. Yeah, super young guy. Had great things to say about what it was like here. And he was still at, he says, Joe Rivera ran. Oh, I, love, I learned so much in his classes. Really? You're a software <laughs> software development tech person, you know, working for a company? History helped you here? I thought that was really interesting. He seems like the same kind of person. Money doesn't change you. Perhaps that person who decided he'd give ten million to the church, that's the kind of person he was before. How will you react when uh, you find out? 
find some success out there. Remember, why do you, how many of y'all think that uh, Ragged Dick's going to be, what, is, what do you call himself? Richard something Esquire, whatever, what was the song? Richard, Richard yeah, Richard S. Hunter Esquire. <laughs> He's going big time. Do you think he'll be able to keep his money? Do you think he'll work his way up from clerk to VP? Do you think he will? What makes you think he will? Work hard. What else? What else have we talked about that he does? He works hard. Takes risks. Takes risks. Oh, okay, that's kind of cool. You need that in the financial industry. What else? There's not too many risks. <clears throat> great depression or great recession. <laughs> AIG. Lehman Brothers. <clears throat> Bear Stearns. Oh. Uh, what else? You take risks. You work hard. Well, there's something else. He takes advantage of opportunities. Remember what I said he was doing, even though he was lower class? Saving. He's not drinking a lot of take home pay. One of my favorite songwriters, Billy Joel. I can't save. Is he a nice person to other people? Yeah, he's got a roommate to treat that person well, trying to help out the others. So we know he's going to succeed. We don't even need to know that he's going to, we don't need to read that he became VP in the conclusion. We know he's going to be it because he's that kind of person. For Wednesday, I want you to read Harlan Dalton's critique. It's called Horatio Alger, but it's his critique of that. And then be ready for a game on Wednesday. No, it's not Game of Thrones. It's another game. Anyway, uh, go ahead. Question? Oh, the presentations? Uh, I have to have a discussion. I'm glad you mentioned that. I was going to announce what it was going to be, uh, but there were only like three people here at the beginning. Uh, I have to have a discussion with a uh, person. We don't have IRP approval. That's what's like really hurting. So I'm going to talk to this person and see if I can push their idea for a research project over so you can work on your presentations. Look for an email from me uh, before Wednesday's time. But read Dalton, read, read Montios, Gregory Montios, and be ready for a game. Sound good?